you asked for it you got it tent talks tunes that sounded so good i'm going to sing it again you asked for it you got it tent talks tunes at that address right there in the real world malcolm tent p.o box 3626 newtown connecticut 06470 that is where my corporal form can be found and my internet form can be found right here baby live on Facebook everybody's favorite social media platform yes indeed you do you can set your calendar by it set your watch by it set your clock by it set your life by it Wednesdays 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time little old me baby Malcolm Tent from Dan Barry I like to get on the uh, internet airwaves and talk to everybody about the great things in life just about all of which are related to music and the artifacts that go with music that's why we call it tent talks tunes We've got a sort of mysterious and arcane program today. It usually is, but today it definitely is. Ah, I love that Danbury tap water. I love to swish it around and clean the spaces between my teeth live on the internet. It's one of those human things that everybody does, man. What can I tell you? What can I tell you? Let's take a look at the monitor and make sure that we're actually going live. Hey, it looks like we are. It looks like we got some views and we got some viewers and at least one thumbs up so far. That's good. That's all I want. I want the attention. I want to know that you are there. Now, as you know, before we talk tunes, we have to do a quick check of the bulletin board and of the mailbox. Uh, mailbox? <laughs> the mailbox was... Uh, somewhat depressingly empty this week which is fine because last week's mail was a utter bonanza i did as you if you did tune in last week you saw that i did an entire episode based only on stuff that i had gotten in the mail last week and it was a corker of course if you didn't see it and you want to relive the glories simply go to my youtube channel it's malcolm tent subscribe to it like it love it learn from it live with it teach me something post comments make remarks let me know what you think about stuff that's at least one of the main reasons why i like doing this to get the conversation going and to get the information flowing and to get the shows showing it's all about showing and telling and having that good interchange between me and you so yeah, mailbox, eh, not much going on in the mailbox world. That's why I flashed the address. I'm going to flash it again for you, Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. I went to the mail, to the post office earlier today and sent out a lot of things to a lot of people. So if you're somebody who mail ordered something from me via Discogs or eBay or Bandcamp, don't worry, it's on the way. If you're one of those people who sent me something really cool in the mail, I got your reciprocation coming right back at you. All with the exception of my friend from Australia who sent me those really cool spoken word discs. I haven't gotten together a package yet for you, but I will. It is going to happen. Might take a while, but it's going to get done. So don't panic. Do not panic. Panic not. It's okay. Let's check the bulletin board before we start talking tunes, shall we? Well, a friendly reminder that I am going to be touring in my capacity as a solo acoustic punk rocker in October. Yes, this thing notwithstanding, I do believe, if all goes well, that one week from tomorrow, this thing's coming off. Pretty sure. Won't know until I actually get there, but it's going to be six weeks in one day since I had the operation to repair the wrist that I broke when I was 19 years old. And uh, the prognosis called for a six-week recovery time with complete wrist immobilization. I am now at 
one day short of five weeks of wrist recovery with complete immobilization. It's been going very well. Thanks to everybody who's been asking. I can wiggle my fingers and get a little bit of grip. Don't have a whole lot of grip strength, but I am able to grip. And yeah, some stretch, some dexterity. Much better than it was even a week ago, and certainly better than it was two weeks ago. Good enough that I believe that I will be, in fact, I know for a dang fact, Lord willing and the creeks don't rise, that I will be in Charlotte, North Carolina this coming Sunday in the studio, actually laying down a hot bass part for the last song on the brand new Anti-Scene album. The album's called Great Disasters. And we've got one song left to finish for the album. All it needs is a bass part. And it is written on my calendar to be in Charlotte on Sunday with a borrowed piece of Thunder Lumber at the home of Sir Barry Hannibal, former anti-scene bass player, current anti-scene drummer, in the studio there with our engineer Mark Tuttero. Yes, I'm going to be thumping and plunking and strumming that thing and laying down some hot licks and tasty riffs. And then Great Disasters will be in the can. All it needs is some mixing, and we're good to go. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Anyway, I digress. The point being that come October, in mid-October, I have every reason to believe that I will be well enough to pick up my solo acoustic guitar, the Starvation Box, and hit the road with my good pal Tim Holhouse. Yes, Tim from merry old England is coming over to the U.S. of A. for one of his many, 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 many tours. The guy is a globe trotter, a world traveler. He's always playing somewhere. He and I have done a number of tours in the U.S. We've done a couple overseas. Always a good time. The guy is a top shelf musician, an ace fellow and one hell of an entertainer. So I am very, very, very much looking forward to playing these shows with Tim in October. Starting October 13th at Bell Tower Records in Adams, Massachusetts. Working our way to the News Cafe, October 14th in Providence, Rhode Island. Willimantic Willimantic Records, October 15th in Willimantic, Connecticut, oddly enough. October 16th, basement show in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And then a house show in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Then another house show in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. And wouldn't you know it, another house show at the very end of the run, October 19th, in Lancaster, as they say it. We say Lancaster. They say Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Yes. Very, very much looking forward to that. After the rock and roll solo acoustic merriment in October, we got some stuff happening in November with the almighty anti-scene. November 5th. Scumstock 2022 at the Brass Mug in Tampa, Florida. It's us. A killing tradition. Without MF order. Village of Weedville. And a veritable host of other bands that will frighten your neighbors. It's all happening November 5th at the Brass Mug in Tampa. The night before, I don't think it's been confirmed 100% yet, but we are looking, I believe, at Jacksonville, Florida. And the night before, November 3rd, Wilmington, North Carolina at Reggie's with special guests TBA. Not a band called TBA. No, 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 no. In fact, I wonder, any of you people out there in the 80s who were active in the punk rock scene in the 80s and y'all remember the plethora of three initial bands, you know, like JFA, COC, TSA, DRI, A3I... Um, God, so many of them. Was there ever a hardcore band with the initials TBA? There should have been, because that would have been really funny to see a flyer with the headlining band TBA. What would TBA stand for? Ted Bundy's asshole? To be... Ah! Mm, I'm drawing a blank. I just thought of two. I'll leave it up to you. If you have any good, pithy, bad, indifferent, or just plain old smart-ass answers as to what the initials TBA would stand for in a hardcore band, please post them. 
I want to see what you come up with. Also November 5th, in the great city of Danbury, the Danbury Record and CD Expo at the new location, the VFW Hall, number 149 in downtown Danbury. First time at the VFW Hall. It's going to be a corker. We've already started signing up dealers. we got several brand new faces who are going to show up and be one of the three dozen or so vendors selling lots and lots and lots of great records, tapes, CDs, memorabilia, knickknacks, artifacts, gimcracks, gigaws, knickknocks, whatever there might be. November 5th, Danbury, VFW Hall, record show. You don't want to miss it. And uh, before I get into talking to you, I just want to thank everybody who's been ordering the Gay Cowboys and Bondage Retrospective, the Complete Silliness CD and Cassette, as seen on Bandcamp and Discogs and eBay. I'm getting a lot of great response, people buying cassettes and CDs. Gay Cowboys and Bondage, very important band to yours truly in South Florida in the 1980s. And thanks to Mike Lesser, the... Leader, the leader in Guiding Light of the Gay Cowboys in Bondage, I've been able to reissue their complete discography on my fabulous label, TPOS. So if you haven't checked it out yet, check it out. If you're a fan of that era and that style of music, you need the Gay Cowboys in Bondage. I sort of liken them as being the precursors to the Dead Milkmen. That's like the easiest way I can describe them to people who've never heard the Gay Cowboys in Bondage. Just think Dead Milkmen but somebody doing it a couple of years earlier, and I dare say, better. I'm the label guy. I dare say. Anyway, enough digression. Let's take another quick look at the monitor here. See who's commenting and saying what about what. This thing only shows me so much. I can't see everybody. I dare say. Be quiet. I already heard me. Um, hey, Freddie Alva from War Dance Records says someone's got to start a band called TBA. It's got to be done. Clint from Pompano Beach is in the house. Bob from uh, Brookfield, Connecticut says that Free Beer and Chicken were a band, and I'm sure people showed up for that. No problem. Max wants to know what the shirt says. The shirt says Human Adult Band. The Human Adult Band are good pals of mine from the New Hope, Pennsylvania area. My fabulous noise improv band, Ultra Bunny, has shared the stage with these guys a number of times. They are like the perfect match for Ultra Bunny. They are loud, sludgy, irreverent, not very fast, and really weird. And they rock really hard. And I'm personally looking forward to getting Ultra Bunny reactivated so we can share the stage again with Human Adult Band. So if you guys have heard Ultra Bunny and you like Ultra Bunny and you want to check out some kindred spirits of ours, Human Adult Band. I like them. I recommend them. Who else is tuned in? Ah, oh, yes, the, the, the famous others are tuned in. Ah, oh, my birthday buddy, Jenny DeSoto, is tuned in from New Jersey. Jenny, how are you doing? How is the process going? I hope you're doing all right. And Matt Vane from North Carolina and Mike Phillips, and the aforementioned others. All right, gang. We've done the openers. Are you ready? Tent Talks Tunes. So I posted the photo, the uh, sort of shill photo that I post every Wednesday afternoon when I'm going to go live, of four records that have something in common. One of them was a Tiny Tim record, one was a Devo record, one was a Sun Ra record, and one, for some really strange, unknown, unknowable reason, at least as of this speaking, was a uh, Jethro Tull record. What could that possibly mean? What could that possibly mean? Well, I mean, we got a couple of clues. I mean, I love Devo, I love Sun Ra. I love Tiny Tim. I hate Jethro Tull. Okay, so that's not necessarily a common thread. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I can't belabor the point anymore. What it is, what those four records have in common, is that I am an avid collector. There are not very many bands that I avidly collect anymore. I, I'm almost the man who's got everything. I'm not quite the man who's got everything, but I'll tell you, kids, it's pretty close. It's pretty close. Luckily, there's always some new obsession that's going to rear its head, and I can just sink my teeth into it, focus my eyes on it, and collect these bands hardcore and big time. Now, before you get into a tizzy, before you hit the panic button, before you pull the fire alarm, before you call 911, <clears throat> excuse me, let me give you my best assurance, my most solemn guarantee, my word as a record seller and a fanboy that I have not begun collecting Jethro Tull records. It has not happened. Ain't happening. Ain't gonna happen. But what I do love to collect is old vintage bootleg LPs, of which this Jethro Tull is an example. This is an original trademark of quality LP from the early 1970s with the original rubber stamp applied by a human being, the original sticker applied by a human being. According to the book I read on trademark of quality, it was quite, quite likely a homeless guy who they would let come into TMOQ headquarters and rubber stamp album covers all day and maybe buy him a six pack of beer or something. That's how that rubber stamp was applied to this cover. And of course the famous pig label with the cryptic notation side one and the cryptic notation side two. And I'm sure you can see the lovely shade of Robin's egg blue that the record is pressed on. I love these things, even though I utterly detest Jethro Tull. Anybody got an opinion on Jethro Tull? I want to hear you people weigh in. Who's got an opinion on Jethro Tull? My bet is that the Jethro Tull haters are going to outnumber the Jethro Tull lovers. And we can do it graphically. If you like Jethro Tull, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like Jethro Tull, give it an angry face. I want to look at this screen here and see live, without words, representations of thumbs up and angry faces. What is your opinion of Jethro Tull? You get a thumbs up or an angry face? Jenny DeSoto says, ew. Good enough for me, Jenny. And she also remarks that the album looks unplayed. As far as I'm concerned, it's unplayed. You ain't going to hear me playing the damn thing. Well, so far we've got one, oh boy, hmm, oh, lots of angry faces. <laughs> we got one thumbs up, we got three thumbs up. I can't count the angry faces. The angry faces seem to be definitely outnumbering the thumbs up. Sorry guys, not trying to start a civil war here or anything. I was just curious to know what you thought about Jethro Tull and what kind of buttons Jethro Tull pushes in your delicate psyche. Yeah, ooh, strong reactions, baby, strong reactions. Anyway, Jethro Tull notwithstanding, I just love the artifact. You know, because when, when I was a kid, these kinds of things were extremely difficult to get. You really had to look hard to find them. Um, bootlegs of any sort, they were tough to find. And, you know, they had all of the, wow, those angry faces just keep pouring in. Gosh, dang. I didn't know so many people hated Jethro Tull out there. That's great. I love it. You guys take my mummified, jaundiced heart and almost make it beat. Almost. Not quite, but almost. Yeah, Jethro Tull. I'm going to take my gimp arm and give them a thumbs down. But I am going to give a big thumbs up to the lure of the forbidden. Yeah, because these things were hard to find for a reason. They were strictly frowned upon by the industry. A lot of the bands actually liked them. Paul McCartney, for example, is a very well-known and outspoken supporter 
of bootlegs. Lou Reed was a big fan of bootlegs. The guys in REM actively collected REM bootleg LPs. So, you know, as far as the artists went, by and large, it wasn't a big deal. There were, of course, exceptions. Frank Zappa hated them. But Frank Zappa hated just about everything, so that's really nothing new. Um, Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton was uh, vehemently anti-bootleg, but that's okay because I'm vehemently anti-Eric Clapton, as I think anybody with a smidgen of good taste is. If you have just a modicum of good taste, you're anti-Eric Clapton. I'm not going to ask for a thumbs up versus hate face on Eric Clapton because... I already know. Okay, I already know. And I don't need to see the graph. Oh, wait, there is an angry face. Somebody did have to express their hatred for Eric Clapton. Fine with me. No problem here, kids. Freedom of speech when it comes to hatred for Eric Clapton is strongly encouraged. And lots of fun here on Tent Talks Tunes. Robert Fripp from King Crimson also virulently, vehemently, vivaciously, viciously, violently opposed to bootlegs. And there's actually a really cool, extremely verbose essay that he wrote on the topic, which ran, I think, in 1995 in Guitar Player or a magazine like that, which some bootlegger reprinted on the back of a King Crimson bootleg LP. That's just another reason why I love the bootleggers so much. Wicked sense of humor extreme tongue-in-cheek outlook on things. Really good example is this, um, another trademark of quality, pressing the Led Zeppelin Bonzo's Birthday Party with the absolutely irreverent cover art by William Stout. Pen and ink drawing at its finest. You guys have gone heard me go on and on and on about my love for pen and ink art. Somebody who actually takes a piece of paper and a pen with some ink in it and draws something. And William Stout was one of the best. He did tons and tons of album covers, bootlegs and legit. He did the logo for Rhino Records. He did a lot of stuff for Rhino Records. Um, I see album covers by him popping up hither and yon, quite often unexpectedly, too. <clears throat> but man, that's a classic, irreverent album cover design for a Led Zeppelin album. And like the other uh, trademark of quality record I just showed you, it's got a variant on the TMOQ labels. It's on yellow vinyl, this one, with black and silver labels. Sound quality on this one's really good, too. I mean, I haven't listened to the Jethro Tull, as we've already agonizingly uh, ascertained, but this one's really good. Um, if I have my genealogy correct, there was a guy named Mike, uh, I want to say Miller, two disc set, one on blue. I want to say Mike Miller, I might have that wrong, but his nickname was Mike the Mike. And Mike the Mike was famous for going to concerts at the LA Forum in Inglewood, California with a fake wheelchair. And the wheelchair was wired for sound. He had microphones like embedded into this thing. And so being in a wheelchair, they would give him the best spot in the house. So he would just sit there in this rigged wheelchair of his with the microphones aimed front and center and get the most killer audience recordings you can imagine. I mean, a real, real feat you know, especially considering he was doing this in the 60s and 70s when recording technology was really big and bulky and cumbersome and, uh, you know, PA systems weren't really at the um, level of development that they are now. But apparently, by everything I've heard from uh, Mike Millard, Millard was his name, I'm pretty sure, from everything I've heard from the Mike Millard tape archive, the, the LA Forum had fantastic acoustics and wherever they put that wheelchair of his he was in the right spot man the sonic sweet spot and trademark of quality issued a lot of his tapes on vinyl and uh, the, man they sound really good that's that's one reason why these things are so much to collect so much reason what one reason why they're so much fun to collect 
is because they're quite often a sonic treat to listen to. You can just imagine being a, a music nerd like myself in the 70s and <clears throat> only being able to read about a Led Zeppelin concert in Los Angeles you know, in a magazine weeks, if not months after the event, let alone hear it. It was like almost impossible to actually hear this stuff. So that's why the bootleggers were providing an invaluable service. They were bringing this music to the people when nobody else was. Led Zeppelin were also fanatically, at least at the time, anti-bootleg. F you, Led Zeppelin. So yeah, <clears throat> collecting vintage boot vinyl. Whenever I go to a record store or a thrift shop or a tag sale or whatever, I don't, I mean, most places don't have sections for those kinds of things because they're so scarce and so hard to find. But it's just part of that thrill of the hunt. Every now and again, you'll be going through a, a bin of just records and whoa, one will pop up. And I'm so far gone that I will actually buy or trade or whatever, a, a vintage bootleg LP by somebody like Jethro Tull. <sighs> Just because of what it is, because it's such a cool artifact from a medium that I love from a bygone era. Yes. Guilty. Guilty. I don't plead guilty, I just am guilty. It's the only Jethro Tull record you're going to find in my collection. Ugh. Let's drink a begrudging toast to the trademark of quality and all the people who followed in their wake and created an entire alternative music industry. Ah, that Danbury tap. <coughs> it never went down so smooth. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> that wasn't even supposed to be funny. It just kind of happened that way. Who else do I avidly collect? <clears throat> <clears throat> Sounds like I'm dying, but I swear I'm not. Yes, that will be archived on my YouTube channel. That entire coughing fit will be archived on my YouTube channel. I do not edit Tent Talks tunes. I don't cut out the embarrassing moments. I don't make it all feel good and rainbows and unicorns and pink bow ribbons. No. You get it warts and all, baby. The exact way it went down is the exact way it goes on my permanent record. For better or worse. I've been seeing a lot of comments coming through here on the monitor. Let's see here. Ooh. Lots of comments from Jenny in New Jersey. Chrissy in North Carolina is watching. Uh, Mark Deal says something about Foghat. Mark Deal, Foghat played in my little hometown, and Lonesome Dave of Foghat came into our local record store. He was stoked on the amount of bootleg releases in the shop. Right on, Lonesome Dave Peverett. I salute you. I even have some Foghat records in my personal collection. Foghat Live, you know, I just might have to go on a tangent here. Foghat Live was probably my favorite record when I was in the eighth grade. I just about wore that record out. You know, slow ride, take it easy, slow ride. Oh, man, still got Foghat Live to this day in my personal record collection. Yes. It's the only Fog Hat record I have in my personal collection. It's probably enough. To this day, I've never heard any other Fog Hat record except for Fog Hat Live. Does anybody out there think I need to hear any of the other Fog Hat records? Let me know. If I'm missing something, clue me in. Fill my ear. Fill this ear with Fog Hat. I mean, what am I missing? Tight shoes? Stone blue? Uh, girls to Chat, Boys to Bounce, Fool for the City, uh, Rock and Roll, the first self-titled album. Am I missing anything with these Fog Hat records? you got to tell me. I'm very, very curious. My mind is not so shut tight that I won't check out a Fog Hat record if somebody recommends it to me. 
How's that for open-mindedness? Pretty cool, huh? That's why this is Tent Talks Tunes. Sometimes you don't know it, but you are destined to end up collecting a certain artist. Intuition has played a large role in the shaping of my record collection. And that is absolutely true for the next artist who I have now, only just the other day, realized that I am collecting fanatically. And that is, of course, this guy right here, Tiny Tim. God bless Tiny Tim. It didn't start out that way. Honest to God. It didn't start out that way. It just kind of happened that way. A bunch of years ago, I believe it was the 90s. Let's see if this thing's got a copyright date on it. Not too sure if it does. I'm going to say 90s, late 90s, maybe the early 2000s. Actually, I think early 2000s. Early 2000s, Rhino Records had a series called Rhino Handmade. They may, Maybe they still do. I don't know. I've lost track of it. But Rhino used to have this thing called Rhino Handmade. And it was a series of super deluxe CDs in limited editions that you could only get by mail. And, you know, I'm a collector. I'm a mark for that kind of stuff. I just love that stuff. So I started following Rhino Handmade avidly. Didn't buy everything they put out because, you know, you got to draw the line somewhere. If there was a Jethro Tull Rhino Handmade release, for example, I never got it. I never did. But I definitely went for the weird, obscure stuff they put out. And they put out a lot of weird, obscure stuff. I got the Sonny Bono Deluxe Mail Order Only CD Numbered Limited Edition with tons of bonus cuts. Yes, Sonny Bono. Jack Webb. Um, Wild Man Fisher. You know, I love that kind of stuff. I love outsider music. Sincerely made outsider music. And it was probably just for that reason and no other that I went for the Tiny Tim Deluxe 3 CD issue of Tiny's first three albums, which came out on the Reprise label. The second one is missing because it's in the CD player right now. With just loads and loads and loads of bonus cuts. And a big old booklet with lots of liner notes and photos. I mean, they really, they really did a good job with these things. Um, well worth the price. And at the time, the deal was when they were out of print, they were out of print forever. Of course, that has since changed. A lot of the material has been issued and reissued in different form. But hey, whatever, at bare minimum, the original numbered edition was never reissued. So anyway, because of my love for outsider music, I said, well, Tiny Tim. They did this Tiny Tim box set. I went ahead and bought it. Cracked it open. I might have listened to a couple of the songs on it, you know, cursorily, and then just sort of put it away because it was just a thing that I had to collect. But as time went on, and I, you know, continued to buy record collections, which is what I do. I buy and sell record collections. And you know, see Tiny Tim stuff around. I just started picking up Tiny Tim stuff. Just because, I don't know, same reason I wasn't, didn't really plan to listen to any of it. Um, it just seemed like something I had to do. And Tiny Tim records are plentiful, and they're usually cheap. Usually real cheap. Because he put out a lot of records. I mean, a lot of damn records. Most of them were novelty records on small labels. Most of them were 45s. They just sort of came and went, and nobody ever really cared. The turning point in my obsession with Tiny Tim came when this dude, Justin Martell, wrote a book called Tiny Tim, Eternal Troubadour. I heard about it because a friend of mine named Dave Elliott, who is a really cool guitar player from New Haven, he's got a great band, or had a great band, called Mendition of the Quay. Mendition of the Quay from New Haven. 
kind of a 60s psychedelic band, but very smart, very eccentric. I really like Mendition of the Quay. I gave them a lot of airplay on my radio show, which will be airing again sooner or later. It's going to happen. Anyway, Dave Elliott said, hey, man, my friend just wrote this book about Tiny Tim. Would you like to have him on your radio show to talk about Tiny Tim and play some rare tracks? I said, I would love it. The allure of rare tracks is what really got me because I just love that kind of stuff. You know, it's the bootleg aesthetic. So the dude came on the show, talked about Tiny Tim, and I was blown away. I had no idea of just how legit Tiny Tim was, how completely authentic the guy was, how what he did was not a put-on. It was a legitimate art form, real music made sincerely from the man's heart and with a bottomless knowledge of obscure turn of the 19th and 20th century crooners and balladeers and novelty bands and stuff like that. This guy knew his shite, both Tiny Tim and Justin Martell. So that was it. That made me want to really listen to Tiny Tim stuff with more of a a serious ear. And the more I listened, the more I was rewarded. Um, Especially, like, if you're going to start somewhere with Tiny Tim, start with the first at least the first two albums he did on Reprise Records. God bless Tiny Tim. Why am I showing you this CD? Ha! CDs, I collect them, sure. But the vinyl is much better. The original first album, God bless Tiny Tim, of which I inadvertently stumbled upon an autographed copy. Look at that. Signed by by Tiny Tim himself. Either that one which is very easy to find, very common, or is somewhat harder to find second album, uh, appropriately called Tiny Tim's second album, which, for my money, is even better than the first one. They're both pretty damn good, but the second album? Wow. This is something else. Between Tiny Tim's performance and the production of Richard Perry, you've got an absolute masterpiece because Richard Perry was very serious about Tiny Tim as an artist and produced and arranged these songs with a full orchestra with a full variety of instruments all the way from rock band to string quartet and he gave every single song a very serious loving underpinning and you can tell Tiny Tim was singing his heart out. I mean, he you can hear the love that he had for this music. And it just works. I mean, I, I've, been, I've gotten weepy listening to some of the songs on these two albums, man. Incredible. So the obsession gets deeper. Even to the point where when I saw this record, which is also a very common Tiny Tim record, I had to pick it up. Um, This record was released between the first two. It was actually recorded in 1962, but not released until 1969. And it sucks. This record is terrible. Why is this record terrible? Because in typical Tiny Tim fashion, and this story... This is a recurring theme in Tiny Tim's story throughout his entire life. Somewhere during the making of this album, somebody said something to offend Tiny Tim, to irk him or irritate him or piss him off or whatever. Who even knows? Something triggered Tiny Tim, and he said, well, I'll show these guys. I'll just sing the entire album out of tune. I'll sing it off-key, and I'll sing it with the meter all screwed up. And then they won't be able to release it. Ha, 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 ha. So he did. He sang the entire album out of tune with bad rhythm. And it's terrible. So ha, 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 he showed them. But guess what? Once Tiny Tim got famous, they showed him and went ahead and released it anyway. 
And not only that, they overdubbed this terrible, god-awful, cheesy, fake applause track on it. And this really ridiculous, terrible laugh track on it. So what you've got is an album that reinforces the popular perception of Tiny Tim as a very bad, as in not good, as in shite, very bad comedy act instead of a serious singer. You hear a guy warbling off key and out of time with a laugh track behind it. And it's shit. It sucks. I've never made it through this album once. And this record came out after his first album and sold probably 100,000 copies. And this was a lot of people's introduction to Tiny Tim. And it's, it's commonly accepted that the success of this album is why his legit second album failed. Because so many people bought this and heard a goddamn lousy record, they said, okay, well, this guy's just a big old joke. Forget it. I've heard all I need to hear. Just write him off. Ah, Tiny Tim shouldn't have been so spiteful. But just to show you how fanatical I am with collecting Tiny Tim records, that record resides proudly in my collection. Just because it so perfectly illustrates the story of Tiny Tim and the way he did things and the consequences of the way he did things. So, you know, the first album had Tiptoe Through the Tulips, big hit. Second album didn't sell for Jack, even though it's got... And I'm going to do you people a favor right now. When I'm done talking, go on to YouTube and look up Great Balls of Fire by Tiny Tim. I guarantee you've heard nothing like it. And it is the best. Tiny Tim doing Great Balls of Fire by Jerry Lee Lewis. That should have been a hit. But it wasn't. He had a contract to do one more album with Reprise, so he did a children's album, Tiny Tim for All My Little Friends. It sold even less than the second record. This is the only copy of this album I've ever seen. I've never seen a copy of this record other than the one I'm holding right now. I got it from a record store in D.C. a few years ago. Haven't played this one yet, but I'm gonna. Very cool. Great version. Well, I'm not, I don't know if this version is great. It's gotta be, but there's a song he does called um, I'm Just uh, I'm a Lonesome Little Raindrop. I think it's on his second album. Not sure. There's a couple versions of it. Man. <laughs> if you don't get a little bit weepy hearing that one, you just haven't got a heart. So for years and years and years after that, Tiny Tim's career consisted of hooking up with people who believed in him and were genuine fans of his and really loved his music for what it was and were willing to take a chance on working with him. So that's why you've got this bonanza of one-off singles. I mean, there's just so many of them. Here's this one. I want to get crazy with you backed with Leave Me Satisfied. This was going to be on a country western album recorded in Nashville. These tunes are great. It's Tiny singing in, not singing in his falsetto, singing in more of a baritone voice. He had a great baritone voice. I mean, he could sing in any register that he wanted to. The falsetto, I mean, we all know the falsetto, but really good lower register voice. And these are like really good country western novelty songs from I think the late 80s. We got a date on this? No date. But two singles from this album. And as I just mentioned before, something happened, some kind of quibble, some kind of tiff between Tiny and the guys financing the record. And that was it. The single came out. The album never came out. Tiny flew the coop, and that was the end of that. Apparently, there were promotional copies of the full-length album that were pressed and distributed. Rare as hell, but judging by how good this single is, I want to hear that full-length album. It's got to be out there somewhere. Here's one for you. This is kind of typical of the novelty records that he was uh, reduced to doing. 
later in his career. Uh, Tiptoe to the Gas Pumps. This is from, I think, 1979. It could be from the present day, just showing you people that some things never change. You could do Tiptoe to the Gas Pumps in 1979. You can do it in 2022. The B-side, though, is fantastic. A song called The Hickey on Your Neck. Awesome sort of narrative recitation by Tiny Tim about his cheating woman. This actually sold pretty well. Common record on a subsidiary of TK Records, home of Blowfly and Gwen McRae and others like that. And also Tiny Tim for a minute or two. Here's another one. Comic Strip Man. It's a disco song. Not a great disco song. It's an okay disco song with a you know decent Tiny Tim performance. Uh, the B-side, I just actually showed you the, uh, the B-side. The A-side, Comic Strip Man. The B-side, Tell Me That You Love Me. More of a traditional sounding Tiny Tim song with some very nice accompaniment. That's a good one. That's a good track. Same deal. He hooked up with these guys. They started a label. They recorded an album for him. Something happened to where Tiny was displeased, and that was the end of the project. He left the label holding the bag. There were going to be two albums from these recording sessions. None of them ever, none of them ever appeared. Just a single. Maybe another single. Similar story. This one uh, was actually put out by a guy that I'm acquainted with, a guy named Stuart Hirsch, who I think is still from Connecticut. Not sure. He wrote a novelty song based on uh, Elvis Presley when Elvis sightings were common. Okay, I saw Mr. Presley tiptoeing through the tulips. They recorded that song and a couple of others. Uh, Stuart Hirsch was shopping around for a deal. While he was doing it, Tiny insisted that promo copies be pressed on this very small label called 20th Century. Label Copies were pressed, promo only. It's got Mr. Presley on the A side, Mr. Presley on the B side. While this record was out on this label as a promo only, Stuart Hirsch actually got a deal with RCA to release this record as a sort of Elvis Presley mania cash-in. And Tiny Tim said, no, 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 we can't do that. It's already on this label, which was, I guess, one of his ex-managers or a friend of his or something like that. And Stuart Hurst's like, what are you talking about? The idea was to release that as a promo and then get you a deal. I got you the deal. And Tiny said, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. It would be a betrayal to the 20th century guy. And all right, that was the end of that. I saw Mr. Presley never came out on RCA and um, nothing ever happened with it. Tiny disconnected his phone and that was the end of that. That story was repeated over and over again and over again throughout Tiny's career. The dude was a master at self-sabotage. If I were to offer a theory on that, because I'm a great armchair psychologist, in the Tiny Tim book, Stuart Hirsch is interviewed about the whole thing, and he put forth the idea that Tiny Tim was afraid to succeed. And he doesn't elaborate on that, but to me that made perfect sense. Because you think Tiny Tim at one time was on top of the world. He was the toast of Hollywood. He had all the girls he wanted, all the money he wanted, all the fame and fortune he wanted. But then that terrible album he recorded came out and bit him in the ass. His legit second album didn't sell. His legit third record didn't sell. The money dried up. The girls went away. The five-star accommodations turned into holiday inns. If I had to venture a guess, I would say that the pain of losing all that was more than Tiny Tim could bear. He didn't want to go through that again. So he continually sabotaged any effort that he would have at becoming big again. Because in his mind, being big was equated with losing everything. And he just couldn't hack the thought of losing everything. And that might sound kind of weird, but if you read this book, you'll see that Tiny Tim's psychology was weird in every way. So to have a little psychological twist like that 
um, in his way of thinking about success and fame and why he continually... He didn't only just shoot himself in the foot, he shot himself in the foot, then the ankle, then the knee, then the hip, then the thigh, and then he worked on the other leg. I mean, the way he com so completely ruined his own chances, I think is I think that explains it pretty well. He just couldn't stand to be a failure again. So he decided to just kind of just cut out that whole process. If I'm going to end up back where I am now, staying at the Holiday Inn, why even bother? Let's just stay here now where it's comfortable, and we'll just keep on going. I see the switchboard has been lighting up, man. You talk about Tiny Tim, and... Yeah, Chad Cochran, Tiny Tim, Country and Western, and it's good. It's definitely a novelty, but it's definitely good. So, yeah, I collect the Tiny Tim 45s. I collect the Tiny Tim CDs. Another Rhino Handmade. The Tiny Tim LPs. There are so many of them. And like I said before, there are they are plentiful and they are inexpensive. Which is why they're so much fun to collect. Because you never know when you're going to find one. And it's not going to cost you an arm or one of his shot off legs. I'll mention now, since it is the right time to do so, that I have released a Tiny Tim record on my label, TPOS. It's a split 7-inch of Tiny Tim and his protege, Isidore Fertel. It's awesome. Two a cappella songs by Tiny Tim recorded when he was mildly drunk on beer. And two songs by his protege, who was a trans woman trapped in a man's body in the early 70s before anybody had any understanding whatsoever of what trans was. He does a version of I Am Woman that you've got to hear to believe. And even hearing it, you probably wouldn't believe it. You need it. You want it. you got to have it. Contact me directly. I will be happy to hook you up. And I've got a full-length Tiny Tim album coming out soon, Prisoner of Love, a tribute to Russ Columbo, which Tiny himself said was the best album he ever did. Very excited to have that on my label, TPOS. Gosh, Aroonies, I haven't even gotten into the other two bands that I collect avidly, Devo and Sun Ra. I got so carried away with Tiny Tim. Well... I could do Devo pretty quickly because we all we all know if you guys have watched Tent Talks Tunes more than once, my lifelong love and obsession involving Devo. If you go to my YouTube channel and look at back episodes of Tent Talks Tunes, you'll find plenty of Devo talk there. So yes, I'm the man who has almost everything Devo, but there's always something that I'm missing. And what I'm really kind of keen on these days are obscure South American pressings of Devo records. I don't know why it is, but these, these South American pressings have a certain aesthetic about them. I don't know if you can make it out, but they've got this very DIY, low-budget aesthetic. And the fact that they almost always have the song titles translated into Spanish, which I love... This one here is Trabajando en una mina de corre, which is working in the coal mine. And on the B side, you got Calidad de Condena, which is Race of Doom. This is a Peruvian pressing of working in the coal mine back with Race of Doom. I'm aware of this being released with those two songs in the UK, but nowhere else. That I know of. Doesn't mean it wasn't, but I'm just fascinated by the fact that you can get, only get this coupling, I think, in either England or Peru. That is really esoteric. And this has a uh, stamp on the paper label. Disco de promoción prohibida su venta. Promotional copy, not for sale. A Peruvian... Promo 45 of Devo. I can hardly even imagine anything cooler than that. 
maybe a Peruvian stock copy with this really cool generic Peruvian sleeve of That's Good. Thoughtfully translated. Whoops. Another one of them crude Warner Brothers labels. Eso está bien. That's good. Back with lo que debo hacer, which is what I must do. Two tracks translated into Spanish on a Peruvian 45 by D.E.V.O. from O.H.I.O. Ding, dong, dang. Apparently there are red vinyl promo pressings of these. I do not own one. I've never seen one in person. Do I want one? Yes, I do. Do I want them all? Yes, I do. This is a Mexican pressing of Whip It with the generic Gamma Warner Brothers plastic sleeve. On the B side, you've got Azotalo, which is Turn Around. Actually, sorry, Azotalo is Whip It, and on the B side, you've got uh, Volteate, which is Turn Around. Very cool. There are a lot of Mexican pressings of Devo records. This is one of them. By the way, if any of my friends from Nogi Town are watching, salud Nogi Town! Sus discos de Devo es muy bien, es más poder y en mi corazón. Mexican pressing of Freedom of Choice, which on the label is subtitled Libertad de Elección, and also has all the song titles translated into Spanish. Love it, love it, love it. Here's a really interesting, uh, I think this is uh, Colombian, from the country of Colombia. A 7-inch EP featuring three songs from Oh No, It's Devo, and one song from New Traditionalists with the Freedom of Choice album cover art. Just one reason why I love these exotic foreign pressings, you get these really weird combinations of tracks and strange combinations of artwork that just don't appear anywhere else. And this one, unlike the Peruvian pressings and the Mexican pressings, is a small hole pressing. With the song titles translated, but I can't squint that hard. Might be time to graduate to 2.0s at the dollar store. What do you guys think? Should I do it? Should I admit defeat and get me a set of 2.0s? I don't want to. I'm a stubborn kind of fellow, as Marvin Gaye once said. Let's see, this is another Peruvian 45, Freedom of Choice, with the similar generic sleeve and uh, crude Warner Brothers labels. Here's a really weird, exotic foreign pressing from the weird, exotic foreign country of Canada, or as they say in uh, Newtown, Canada, the splatter vinyl pressing of I Can't Get No Satisfaction. There's also a splatter vinyl pressing of Are We Not Men, We Are Devo with the exact same color scheme. That one's really cool. This is the only 45 that I'm aware of with this splatter vinyl. And it is from Canada. Love Canada. These are the kinds of Devo records I collect. Along with test pressings, acetates, Miss pressings. I mean, I really literally have every single regular version of every American and most major European pressings. It's all about the South American and the Israeli and South African and strange, strange, strange countries. This is also Peruvian. No, actually, this is Venezuelan. Venezuelan pressing of uh, freedom of choice. Here's a Mexican pressing of Shout, which has the title thoughtfully translated on the back. Grito. Devo. Grito. And finally, another exotic South American pressing. 
country is this one from? I can't quite read it. But uh, once again, beautifully translated. Oh no, S. Devo. I think that this one is from Uruguay. A friend of mine from South America heard me say Uruguay once, and she thought that was the funniest thing ever. Uruguay. Pretty sure. I look at that. Difi, uh, difusión prohibida su venta. Another promotional copy. Love it. That, my friends, is exotic, foreign. And downright weird. So yeah, that's what uh, Jethro Tall, Devo, Tiny Tim, and Sun Ra have in common. I've been here for an hour. My voice is starting to give up. I have not even addressed the pile of Sun Ra stuff I was going to talk about. We'll have to save that for a later episode of Tent Talks Tunes. If you want to private message me about Sun Ra... I'll tell you everything I know. If you also want to message me about Tiny Tim, maybe you know one of these people who tried to put out a Tiny Tim record and got burned. Maybe you know somebody who's got a thousand copies of a Tiny Tim record sitting in their garage or about to end up in a dumpster. Don't throw them away. Talk to me today. I'm fascinated by this stuff. And of course, Devo. Anyway, want to thank everybody for tuning in. It's always, always a hoot and a holler to come on to Facebook Live and YouTube Archived Forever to do Tent Talks Tunes. Even though I will be in North Carolina this weekend recording, I'm pretty sure that I will be on the air next week in about 167 hours' time. Maybe then I'll dig into this incredible pile of Sun Ra records, which... What a bottomless well. So yeah, check in in about 167 hours, and we'll see what happens. Thanks for tuning in. Hope y'all are doing well. Until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>